Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about pre protocol deviations. These are inevitable facts of life, no matter how great a research coordinator you are, in which I'm sure you're going to be a great one. Um, these are deviations that happen all the time, and so we're going to talk a little bit about them. There's not a lot in the regula there's actually nothing in the regulations about them, so this is a sort of a good topic to, to, to think about. A deviation is nothing more than a failure to follow your IRB approved protocol. Um, and there are lots of places in a protocol to drop the ball and not follow it to the letter. And when I say follow it uh, or adhere to it, I mean to the letter. You're going to do exactly what the protocol requires you to do with your, with your subjects. Um, the thing about this is there's nothing in HHS, FDA, or ICH language that talks about what a deviation or a violation is, and I think this is one of the reasons, one of a few reasons why um, they tend to cause a lot of anxiety among research coordinators. Um, without specific language to fall back on, it feels very um, loosey-goosey, and sometimes really good coordinators like to have strong parameters. They like to know what the rules are so that they can file, follow them. So there is nothing written about it because, in all honesty, it's not supposed to happen, um, and it does happen. So, And also the term deviation and violation are used interchangeably. I prefer the term deviation just because it's a, a little more gentle. Uh, I do believe in uh, uh, good intentions, and um, violation sounds a lot more deliberate and intentional, and um, just it sounds worse. So everywhere it says violation in this lecture, I'm going to refer to as deviation. Um, because again, if there's nothing in the law to, to sort of talk about them, you will find both terms used interchangeably. So let's talk about how you classify them. Um, this is part of the anxiety inducing problem with uh, deviations that there's, there's no formal classification system. Again, good coordinators like to know what the parameters are and we don't have any. Um, some people will say a sin is a sin and anything that doesn't follow the protocol is a deviation and that is technically correct. That is absolutely true. You're supposed to do exactly what is in the protocol. Um, but you still want to talk about what are the worrisome deviations and what are the less worrisome deviations. So I'm going to talk about a classification system uh, according to risk. And this, I think, for me, helps determine what are the deviations that are really considered serious and which are the lesser, the minor deviations. Because even though a sin is a sin, we have to have some way to talk about them and prioritize them. Um, and I think risk works especially well. And again, there's nothing, there's no language anywhere. The FDA doesn't have a guidance document about this. So there can be lots of ways you can classify them in your head. For me, this works really well. I hope it works well for you because it takes into consideration um, the risk. The major then uh, deviations would be those which affect patient safety, patient rights, or data integrity. And I would consider them in that order because patient safety always comes first. If you start assessing things according to patient safety, it will guide you in making the best decision. So patient safety, remember the FDA just wants to know is this drug safe and does it work? So safety is always at the top of the list. Um, ethically speaking, we want to have the rights and welfares of patients at the top of the list. And then data integrity is obviously important because the FDA needs to be able to um, make a decision based on the data that's submitted to them. So that would be major, uh, how I would classify a major uh, deviation affecting patient safety, patient rights, or the data. So let's talk about, let's give some examples of major violations. Not obtaining the informed consent. Man, that would be a big bad one. So n not obtaining consent is basically not giving the person the information they need to make a good decision for themselves. Um, and that would be a huge violation of their rights. So I hope you never work somewhere where they fail to obtain informed consent, um, but that would be a huge problem. 
failing to report your serious adverse, adverse events to the IRB and or the sponsor. This impacts not just your site, but those serious adverse events um, when they are new and unexpected um, really have a ripple out effect on participants at other sites. So your, every site has to take reporting SAEs very seriously so that participants at all the sites and all the studies are being given the best information. Um, so that would be a huge problem. Failing to perform any lab test or any procedure for that matter, not just a lab test, but any procedure that directly affects patient safety. So if you're doing an EKG on a regular basis to look for cardiac problems and that's not done, huge issue. Um, so everything that's in your protocol that's being done for safety, so things are being done for safety as well as data. For those things that are being done for safety, failing to perform them, I would consider that to be a major uh, deviation because it could affect that individual's safety and put them at additional risk. A dosing error, whether it's an underdosing or an overdosing, would be considered a major violation. Minor things then are going to be deviations that are administrative and don't affect safety or data, or safety or the rights or data, I would say. So these are like the minor, teeny little things. And again, there's still, there's still deviations, so there's still a sin is a sin, um, but these again are not going to affect the patient's safety, uh, the rights or the data. So some examples of that would be the lost original consent form, uh, where you still have a photocopy of it, so you could still demonstrate to a monitor or to an auditor that the consent form was completed correctly, but you lost the original one. It could even be something that was totally out of your control, like uh, your hospital was inundated with water during a flood, um, but still it'd be a violation. Uh, inappropriate documentation of the informed consent. So you're getting the informed consent, but you're not doing it in, in the best way possible, like you're missing your investigator's signature. It might just be your investigator is uh, very engaged in a conversation with a participant and doesn't even realize that he or she failed to sign it. But still, no signature is a problem. So. Uh, failing to give a copy to the participant. You're going to document that somehow that they were given their copy uh, when they left and failing to document that is the same as failing to give it to the participant. Um, so those would be minor violations, right? There's, the participants are still safe. They, we've still maintained their rights by the informed consent process, but it was done incompletely or a little incorrectly. Um, failure of your subject to return study medication. Again, this doesn't put anybody at any additional risk, it doesn't impair their rights, it doesn't do anything to the data, but the spot you and therefore the sponsor, excuse me, I just said it backwards, the sponsor and therefore you are held accountable for all the investigational drug. So if you have a subject that doesn't return it, then you have a problem. And you'll find that subjects, some are excellent, they follow instructions precisely, and some are a little bit less than detail oriented and you will find that this can be a problem from time to time but that would be a deviation because a protocol will indicate the subject has to return the meds. Over enrollment. Every participant that's over enrolled that's an additional person that might be at risk for adverse events um, but if you're doing everything else correct then this would really sort of be mostly a minor violation um, unless there were, this was a study that was extremely risky. In that case, if it was a high, high risk study, I would then refer over enrollment to a major violation. PK sample being obtained close to but not precisely at the assigned time. So if your PK sample is due eight hours after dosing and that makes it 12.04 p.m. and you draw it at 12.02 p.m you're not technically following the protocol. So close to is not the same as exactly as the assigned time, and that would be a minor violation. So we're gonna have lots of things in the gray zone. So remember I just said like about the over enrollment, that's probably gonna be a minor violation. You're gonna find, a, you're gonna have a lot of discussion with people about um, deviations and are they major or minor. And when I say major or minor, really what I'm saying is how worried should you be about the deviation? So there are always going to be lots of questions you should ask to sort of determine 
how major or minor a, a deviation is. So how would you classify this? Uh, use of an invalid consent form. Um, that could be either or. So I'll give you another more detailed. Use of an outdated or expired consent form. If this consent form expired two days ago, then there's been no changes to the consent form other than the IRB puts an annual approval date on it, um, I think that's a minor violation. If the consent form outdated two days ago and the IRB is about to approve a new consent form with a lot of additional information in it, then I'd put that as a major violation because now we're affecting the rights of the participants to make good decisions for themselves. Use of an unapproved consent form. So more questions. Is it just a draft consent form um, that the IRB didn't approve and you for some reason gave it to a participant? Um, and you now have IRB approval but you've just used the wrong draft form? That might be minor, again, depending on how much additional information is in the approved consent form. Now, if you're un using an unapproved consent form because the IRB has not yet approved the study, that's going to be a major violation. Maybe the IRB would never approve the study. So uh, I would have questions about why it was an unapproved form. Enrolling in eligible subjects, always a big no-no but sometimes it could be bigger than other times. Uh, subjects aged six months above the age limit. Now, a word about age limits. They're slowly going away. Uh, sponsors used to do things like an adult study would be like ages 18 to 65. And that is sort of slowly going away because unless you age really the upper limits of age, let me back up have sort of slowly gone away because individuals feel like that's a little ageist. And as long as that individual, adult individual meets all of the other inclusion criteria, we would not exclude them strictly on the basis of their age. So you're not going to find that this is a big problem in adults, in adult studies. Um, you'll see oftentimes ages 18 and up. Now, if you're enrolling someone who is 18 and a half years old in a pediatric study, that obviously is not good, right? So if the study is ages six to 18, and you're someone who's 18 and a half, that might not be good. Um, also, if it's six to, uh, let me back up, I'm gonna say this one. Uh, subjects aged six months below the age limit. So again, if it's 18 to 80, and you enroll someone who's 17 and a half, they're really considered a minor. Um, for purposes of consent. And so this is going to be a problem. Why are you putting a pediatric patient on an adult study? Um, and so the age limit might be important um, depending on which way you're looking at it. Study, su study visit conducted outside of the required, required time frame. So if you have someone who's due for their visit on Christmas and they're not going to come on Christmas, this is maybe day eight visit, Instead, they want to come on Christmas Eve. That's probably going to be good for everybody who's asked about it. So you probably don't want to work on Christmas Day. Your PI doesn't want to work on Christmas Day. The patient doesn't want to come on Christmas Day, right? So could we do it on Christmas Eve? Now, that might be a minor violation. Um, it could be a major violation, depending on what was going to happen on that visit and how time sensitive it was. So if this is a safety visit and you're they're having safety uh, procedures performed, that might be a very big deal. Um, and it might turn out that that one day difference could make a difference in, uh, in terms of the safety profile. Um, same sort of thing, if it's due on Christmas and it's performed the day after Christmas, does this make it a major violation? It may or may not. You're always going to ask more questions. And again, and you're going to go back and think about it from the perspective of safety, rights, and data integrity. And when you think about it from those those three things, it will help guide you in the questions you ask and the decisions you arrive at. So what happens if you have repeated violations, right? Um, excessive or repeated violations. So I'm only going to have that Christmas Day happen, that Christmas Day example happen once a year. But let's say uh, all of my patients are supposed to come on day eight um, to see the investigator and have some labs drawn for safety. 
And instead of day eight, they come on day seven. And they all come on day seven, instead of just one here or there, right? The sponsor's gonna look at that and say, uh, maybe we need to retrain Heather. That girl can't count, and she tends to think that day seven is day eight, when in fact it isn't. So they might wanna come and retrain just me. They might wanna retrain all of us. It depends on what the violation, the deviation is. Um, and so th there might be some retraining that has to happen. The sponsor could also consider drafting an amendment to change the protocol. If there is um, repetitive deviations that are happening, then perhaps there's something not feasible in the protocol. I'll give you an example. Years and years ago, we had a study. I uh, worked on a study where a PK sample was due, so we had to draw blood at the exact same time the patient was supposed to be undergoing an MRI. Well, you cannot perform an MRI and draw blood at the same time without a lot of um, expertise, and we didn't have that expertise. It can be done, but we didn't have the, the capacity to do that. So we told the sponsor that that was going to be a problem, and the sponsor didn't really take the advice very well and allowed the protocol to be approved by the IRB, still requiring that we draw a blood sample at the same time the patient has an MRI. Well, guess what happened? Um, the patient got an MRI, and then the blood sample was drawn either right before or right after the MRI, but not at the precise time point. So every time that those two procedures came upon each other like that, we had a deviation. And so it wasn't a matter of training because everyone understood what was supposed to happen. It was a matter of feasibility. And it wasn't just our site. It was almost all of the sites that had this. Well, actually, it was all the sites for this particular problem. And so the sponsor finally drafted an amendment to change that. Or you could have all of the above. Perhaps an amendment was necessary, but at the same time, maybe that coordinator, Heather, still thinks day seven is the same as day eight, and that's not the case. So it might be a combination of these things, but the sponsor is going to be very concerned, and they will take steps whenever you have uh, repetitive deviations. Now let's talk a little bit about waivers. And waivers, again, are also not anywhere in the regulations, but um, a waiver is nothing more than a protocol deviation that's very limited in nature, nature that is approved by the IRB prior to its initiation. So not all IRBs will, will have something such as waivers, but some IRBs will allow you to have a discussion with them in advance to say this is going to happen. The Christmas Day example is a perfect example of this. So I know the patients are going to have to come on Christmas Day. Now, let me back up. I'm going to be a really good coordinator, and I'm going, to, I'm going to plan it so that I only enroll people so that they come either on Christmas Eve or the day after Christmas. I'm not going to enroll anyone. I'm going to look in advance in the fall, and I'm going to make sure I don't enroll anybody that has something due on Christmas Day. But let's say for some reason that happens. I have a patient that has to come on Christmas Day. No one's going to be there to do this procedure, and the patient doesn't want to come. So I'm going to talk to the IRB and I'm going to say, listen, this is what's happening. The patient's coming on Christmas Day. The patient does not want to come. We don't want to be there. Well, I'm not going to say it like that, but I'm going to somehow explain that our clinic is closed and there will be no one to do the procedure. Um, and I'm going to ask for approval to do um, the blood work or whatever is due the day before the day after. I'm also going to have this discussion with my sponsor so that everybody knows what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to get approval prior to this. Now, if they say, nope, you still have to do it on Christmas Day, well, then it's going to have to be done on Christmas Day or I'll have a deviation. But the waiver is a, is a tool, it's a mechanism by which you can discuss this with your IRB as well as your sponsor to say, this is what we're asking for. Once it's approved by the IRB, protocol changes cannot be initiated without additional IRB approval except cases involving immediate hazard. So um, if the patient is having a serious adverse event that results in hospitalization um, and there are going to be some procedures that are supposed to happen in the protocol, my investigator might decide to not follow the protocol for the best interest of that individual participant who's experiencing the serious adverse event. In that case, right, the IRB is going to say, you trump the protocol for immediate hazard, and we expect that investigator to have that professional judgment to do that. 
uh, but we really can't make any changes without IRB approval. Um, so the waiver is one way to ask the IRB for approval for a individual limited um, uh, very deviation <clears throat> in advance. So that's sort of what a waiver is. Again, not all, all IRBs have them, but some places do have that mechanism in place. Again, here are the references. Um, deviations are very interesting. You will get exposure to them um, at your internship, and definitely once you become a coordinator, you will start um, becoming a lot more experienced with deviations. But please ask me questions if you have them. I would be happy to answer them. Otherwise, take care.